then that is precisely the problem, right? So when you have the central government that is only taking on about 21% of the GDP worth of debt, mm -hmm. and the local government is taking, you know, over 50%, and then plus the hidden debt, then that is anywhere, you know, everybody's a guess, right? But at least, you know, 90% of GDP is debt at the local government level. And so that is really problematic. Because the central government has, like you just said, right, the monetary sovereignty, they are able to issue the currency, they are able to, you know, uh, fiscally spend, the local governments can't, right? And it's not until 2014 that they're allowed to issue bonds, actually. Previously, they, they are not even allowed to issue bonds, right? So that really leaves them in the limbo. So if you ask me what to do, I think, you know, the solution is very simple. You have to realign, right, your fiscal revenues and your spending responsibilities. That's as simple as it gets. If you want the local, local governments to continue to spend, if you believe the spending should take place in the local level, then you need to give them more taxing power. You need to give them more tax revenues. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I've got Yan Liang with me, who's a professor of economics at Williamette University, a private liberal arts college in the US. She's also a research associate at the Levi Economics Institute and a non-resident senior fellow at the Global Development Policy Center of Boston University. Yang specializes in modern monetary theory, that is MMT in short, uh, and the political economy of China, economic development, and international economics. So today we want to discuss this link between MMT and the Chinese approach to monetary policy, as well as the impact of this uh, economic approach to development of, um, of Global South countries. Jan, thank you so much for coming online today. Well, thank you for having me. It's fantastic that you agreed to this because you're actually a student of Randall uh, Ray, who I had on this channel before, and the the topic of MMT or the approach, the way that MMT conceptualizes the economy and the impact of monetary politics, to me is quite an important one because it's different from orthodox kind of uh, uh, economics. Although Randall Ray pointed out your your PhD, your your previous, your former PhD advisor that. Um, you know, all of the things that MMT says were already kind of common knowledge within the Keynesian school uh, of economics. So it's not really new. It's just that it's not being applied. Can you maybe tell us first why you work in this on this field so much as opposed to, let's call it the neoclassic model of, well, supply and demand driven uh, analysis? Yeah, so my academic journey actually really start with the study of Minsky. Um, so I was in China doing my undergraduate. We had a Cornell professor who was a Fulbright who visited my university. Um, and so he taught something about Minsky in terms of the history of capitalism, um, in terms of you know financial instability hypotheses and, and all of that. And so that got me really interested in this alternative approach. Um, and then I pursued my PhD at UMKC working under Randall Ray. Um, so my actually thesis was on China's development and looking at development finance from the MMT's perspective and study how, you know, for example, foreign debt investment, um, whether it helps or not uh, with economic development. And so um, that is sort of the journey. And you're right. I think this approach is very much embedded in the web of what we call heterodox economics, right? So there is the post-Keynesian economics, which is really the direct follower of joint Mena Keynes, right? So Keynes talked about, you know, the modern money has existed for 5,000 years, right? That started with the public institutions, uh, you know, pronounced a union of account and also imposed obligations, um, which can be fulfilled, right, by this union of account. So this is nothing really new in terms of what exactly money is. Uh, but I think what MMT does very well is, um, you know, another strand of the economic thought that is incorporated in MMT is the so-called institutionalism. And that is the original institutionalism with thoughts in Dublin, um, you know, people and uh, uh, sort of that really focus on the, the role of institutions. So we're talking about money, but not in a vacuum, right? We talk about money in very specific historical context and very specific institutions. Um, and so I think that is really what gives MMT the strength that does not start with a very ahistorical concept of money is born from, you know, Hegel and Hagling, right? All the anthropologists, a lot of the historians would tell you that's not where money came from. Um, so I think that is very important that this approach, it really takes a lot of different 
uh, disciplinary insights um, and also really embedded in that sort of heterodox tradition. And so I think that is what gives MMT the strength. And again, I think MMT can be applied so broadly, right? We could look at it from a public finance perspective, right? What can we do with public money? Um, but it could also uh, really apply to a monetary system design uh, perspective, right? Which is money is such an important and powerful institution that moves things. So we need to be part of that monetary design, right? We meaning the people, right? So I think that is why it really fascinates me um, as a way to kind of, you know, learn about MMT and apply it um, in economics. Yeah. Some, pe some people look at MMT as a form of, of ideology of you can, a state can spend how much ever it wants and it doesn't need to, to think about, about money at all. It just prints it and that's it. Um, that's not what MMT is, is it? No, not at all. I think if anything, it's the opposite. So the MMTers would say we are actually not talking about theories. We're talking about a description. We're describing how modern money actually works, right? The history of historical evolution of money, right? So with Mesopotamia, when you have this temple that is using money as a way to appropriate resources and to record debt and the repayments of debt. Um, and it's also a description of how the modern monetary system works, right? So when treasury spends, how it cuts the check and how it gets through the central bank uh, with the clearing process and how bond sales are not a way to finance spending, but it's really to drain the, 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 the reserves that are out there um, to allow central bank to target their interest rates and so on and so forth. So it's really a description of how the real world uh, public monetary system works and private monetary system, by the way. Um, but it does come with certain policy implications, right? And again, it depends on uh, who you ask. Some of the believe, you know, knowing the power of money Right, knowing that money is a public monopoly, that we need to really use the money for public causes. So maybe we want for employment, maybe we want universal health care, uh, maybe we want you know green transition, right? We want to have a green new deal. Um, so knowing the power of public money, right, will lead us to certain uh, policy implications, right? But it's not this idea that government can simply spend like no tomorrow, um, but really sort of we want to use the public money for public purposes. Um, I think that is really the message that MMT tries to deliver. Why do you think it is that especially in the West, Europe, North America, Japan too, this, um, the classic, the neoclassic model um, is so strong and, and so omnipresent? I mean, if you take any kind of class in any kind of average university of economics 101, micro, macro, that's firmly, thoroughly, um, deeply neoclass the neoclassic model that kind of just excludes the analysis of the of the mechanics of how money circulates in the in the in the um, uh, economy. It use it does that a little bit, and then it has these funny notions of the money multiplier in order to explain things a way that it cannot account for. Um, why is this approach, which to me is not fundamentally wrong, it just it just leaves out some of the most fundamental aspects of the, the, the way economies work? Why is that one so prevalent within academia and in the minds, in the heads of a lot of people who have a natural aversion to the idea of government, you know, using the printing press and even people that I admire a lot who have an aversion toward that kind of type of analysis, analytical approach toward looking at how the economy works. Yeah, I think you're being very kind to say that they're not necessarily wrong. I think they're <laughs> wrong and they're purposefully wrong. Um, they're telling the lines, right? That when we, um, you know, read Fr within Friedman, right? Randall Ray had this classic um, statement that every page um, is a lie, right? So it, it's a lot of, I think, ideological driven myths. And I think that is really what it is, right? It serves the purposes of the controlling elite, right? The idea that money is scarce. So, you know, there are certain things we can't do because we can't afford, right? So you wanted to give billionaire, billionaires uh, tax cuts, we can do it, but no, we can't provide free education. We can't provide free healthcare because we don't have the money. So I think, you know, it's a very powerful and very dece de deceptive narrative. And it really serves the interests of the ruling class, right? This idea that 
um, if you don't have the money, you cannot do all these things and you have to sacrifice in order to get the money. Um, and, you know, it just deprive all the general public, right, from participating in that democratic set process of how to use the money, right, for that public purposes. And so I think that is really why it's um, these kinds of myths, right, is really being uh, propagated and it's also really being supported by all these elite universities. And so when it comes to academics, I think you're right. For one, there's a very simple, very simplistic narrative, right? And this, sometimes it sounds very intuitive. Like I gave my students some of the uh, texts from uh, Milton Friedman's page, uh, a book, right? So he talks about how we're all in independent, but we're all interdependent because, you know, there's the market, there's the seller, there's the buyer. Everyone is autonomous. Everyone is mutually join in, you know, get into the market and, and, and have that mutually beneficial exchange. It just paints the picture um, that somehow shows a great appeal to people, right? There's no power, there's no struggle. Everything just happens so naturally and harmoniously. Um, I think people are very easily drawn to that. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, there's all these institutional setup that would really uh, conceal or to silent um, different views, right? If you don't publish in these high level prestigious journals, you can get a job in academics, not in the Ivy League, right? And so there's a lot of exclusiveness that does not allow alternative voice being heard. So we perpetuate the kind of myth, right? And this kind of myth is really what enables, you know, neoliberalism, right? This idea that this is scarce and there's nothing we can do. Uh, we just have to follow the natural law. Um, you know, we, we, we have to just, uh, when the government runs out of money, we have to, you know, suffer from austerity. And so that means, you know, you don't get all these um, things that you need in order to survive just because we don't have the money, right? So I think these are really powerful, but unfortunately, I think it's very, uh, you know, um, uh, deteriorous, very harmful, and very detrimental um, for any economic system, um, you know, for the general uh, purposes, for the general public's, you know, uh, well-being. Do you think that it also has anything to do with the <clears throat> the concepts we use in order to make sense of the world? Because um, it strikes me that certain people who I think who should be like who should be loving MMT and who should be hugging it <laughs> and, and kissing it, like especially on the left, right? Lefties mm -hmm. should love MMT because <laughs> it it kind of it it shows exactly how to do the policies that you want to do, as you just said, like public education, public healthcare, and so on. Because it's not that this is too expensive or we don't have the money. The question is how do we want to allocate it, um, and and how 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 is money used in the economy in order to keep the economy stable, right? Not necessarily do we have the money or not. It's like do we want to allocate or not? Um, exactly. Now, but but at the same time, we are using confusing language in order to conceptualize government debt and government money the, the same way that we use our private debt and private money. And then people think like, yeah, naturally, I have to save first. I have to tighten the belt if I want to go on a nice holiday. If I want something good for myself, then I need to save first. And that's such a misleading way because these two domains don't work the same way, but you use the same language. Is that part of the problem? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of negative connotations to this idea of deficit and debt, right? But what MMT, I think, is doing great is to really utilize the so-called balance of paper, uh, sorry, the balance sheet approach, right? So in any ledger, you have the assets, you have the liabilities, and um, you have, you know, one side is being the creditors, then the other side would have to be the debtor, right? So when you think about the economy, if you separate into the private sector and the public sector, then it makes sense when you think about it, right? If the public sector is in surplus, where does the surplus come from, right? If the public sector wants to be, you know, in the surplus, that means the other side of the ledger, right? The private sector would have to be in deficit, right? And vice versa. So I think this is, you know, very simple and very powerful idea if you just take some time to look at the balance sheets. And that very clearly shows you that not all economic agents can run a surplus. So if the public agent is running a surplus, that means the private agent, the private sector, we have to run a deficit. Um, but again, a lot of times, like you said, right, we always equate public deficit as fiscal mismanagement, right, or living beyond our means, or you know, um, corrupt government and so on and so forth. So I think that's very unfortunate. And you mentioned the left. I think you know there are two types of lefts that 
on the one hand, we have the left that really understands MMT and they understand the power of money, public purposes, public money, design of monetary system for the general good. You have people like Jason Hickel, right, that talks about this economic demographic the democratic process that we wanted to use the power of money to mobilize resources for sustainable, you know, development for the mankind and for more equitable, you know, distribution of resources. Um, you also have people like Michael Hudson, right, that has really debunked a lot of this Americans' financial empires, you know, misbehaves, right, over the centuries. Um, so we do have people who are, you know, on the left and they are enlightened, they understand the nature of money, and that is really empowered them. Um, to to really put forth their policy proposals and also their analysis of capitalism. But you're right. I think we also have some lefts um, who I think in some ways misread Karl Marx, right? That believe that money is a commodity. And I think that's very unfortunate. Um, and of course, there's also a lot of really deep rooted, right? Like we just mentioned, these myths um, that somehow still believe that money is scarce, um, that somehow still confuse the private sector with the private sector, that still somehow thinks the government you know, only works for the elite class, which is in many cases true, right? But that doesn't mean we should just simply give up, right? That is still a very strong and very, you know, important institution um, that we need to, um, you know, take control over with, right? Not just sort of, you know, let it be. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite fascinating. And, you know, the interesting thing is, as you said before, like the, if if MMT is right, and I, I would say it is, um, at least in the largest parts, then um, that's actually the way the modern economy works. I mean, it's not that this is a way that that the MMTlers would like to change the economy. Right. It's, it's already running like that. It's just we don't we don't we don't perceive it in the right way. Therefore, we have stupid concepts of what then needs to be tweaked in order to get like a certain outcome. But that also means that there is a lot of people and a lot of in the in in, in the set in the system a cox in the system that already lead to to an an mmt way of the economy working right and like central bankers or uh, private banks as well right when they make when they make mortgage loans and so on they add to creating money and, and so on and so forth now um how or which parts of the economy, and let's say Western economies, but also now um, global South economies, especially let's say China uh, and and maybe Russia, if you know. But let's let's focus on China because I think that's where your mm -hmm. expertise is. Um, to which extent do these economies actually understand, or the people who are who are pivotal, especially the central bankers, properly understand how the economy works, and or, or do, to what degree are people in charge that actually might not have a complete picture of what their impact on the economy is? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, what I'm most interested in is how MMT can inform, right, development policies and development processes. Um, I think there's still a lot of confusions, um, I think, of even within the MMT community, right? Um, but to the great majority of the people, even if they have some kind of faith in MMT, they would say, this is really a privilege that the United States or Japan or these, you know, advanced the Western economies could enjoy the kinds of uh, sort of monopolies on money, right? That all these developing countries, they simply don't have the luxury to control their own monetary system and therefore use money for their own purposes. And I think to some degree, it is true. A lot of developing countries are a lot more constrained given the current global financial system. What I mean by that is a very important concept in the MMT that is a so-called monetary sovereignty. Right, which is the idea that to what extent the government is able to uh, pronounce a or di dictate a unit account and impose certain obligations, uh, which can be delivered by, you know, uh, getting or sending in these uh, or repaying uh, these obligations in that unit account. So what I mean is in the United States, right? We're using the U.S. dollars, and you are paying taxes in the U.S. dollars, right? So you have the desire to have the U.S. dollar, um, so that is allow that that's what allows the U.S. government to be able to appropriate resources, right? Because people want your money, right? And and so you are able to by issuing this this money and making people work for it, right? So you're able to mobilize the resources, right, for your own uses and for general public uses. Now, in some developing countries, um, they are issuing their own currencies. 
but there are also others that are not, right? So we're talking about El Salvador, we're talking about, you know, El Ecuador, Ecuador, um, they are so-called de-dollarized, right? And uh, sorry, they're, they're dollarized, right? And we also have, you know, some of the Eastern African countries are still using the CFA franc as their currency. So these are some of the countries that have very limited monetary sovereignty because they have no control over the currency, right? So they can't simply, you know, issue um, the currencies and allow the government to spend and, and they can't set their central bank policies because the interest rate is pretty much set by the Fed or the ECB. So these are the countries that are really low in the monetary sovereignty and they cannot use money, right, to do all these other wonderful things. But there are also countries that are issuing public debt in foreign currencies. So we're talking about countries like Kenya, Ghana, Ethiopia, and, and many of the low income countries. Um, they suffer from the so-called or original sin, right? The, the idea that um, their own currencies are not desired in the international market. And so if they wanted to import any essential products, they have to issue dollar bonds, borrow in dollar or euros in order to support their, to, to support their economy. And so these countries are also low in terms of their monetary sovereignty, because again, they are getting in debt in a currency that they have no control over with, okay? But still, I think the great majority of the, uh, I would say middle income or low to middle income or even high to middle income countries, they still have a large degree of monetary sovereignty. They're using their own currencies, they're able to impose taxes, they're able to reflux the currencies back. Um, they have relatively you know, large autonomy in terms of fiscal and monetary policy making. Then I think that's place where they can utilize you know, that kinds of monetary power. Now to your question, I don't think every single policymaker in the world um, has a complete grasp right, of what MMT is about and therefore take policies um, based on the recommendations right, of the MMT scholars. But I do think in terms of China, um, they do have a very stringent fiscal rule um, that they pretty much take from the Western economy, right? 3% deficit to GDP ratio, 60% public debt to GDP ratio. But again, I think the Chinese way is very interesting. I'm writing a paper on the big government in the Ch with Chinese characteristics. I know it's a very cliche title. Um, but what I show is that this, the government actually has four different books. They have the, 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 the normal operational budgets where they, they really stick to the 3% rule. Um, sometimes they will raise it a little bit during COVID. They increase the debt to, the deficit GDP ratio, you know, from 3% to 3.5 to 3.8. But still, they have that fiscal rule. But that said, right, there are a lot of other parts of the government spending that it's not really considered as a normal budget. Um, so they kind of, you know, when you look at the IMF, for example, they would say China's augmented fiscal deficit is anywhere between 9 and 10% of the GDP. And so that is basically some other sort of budgets that are not counting into the official budget. There are also local government spending, right? Which we know these days there's a big discussion about local government debt, right? Because the local government is responsible for 85% of the fiscal spending in China. Um, and so there's a lot of debt that is in the local government, at the local government level, off their balance sheets. Um, so I think that really, you know, in a way, it really helped China to use this fiscal uh, um, you know, fiscal uh, policy, right, to help with the economic growth, right? In China, we talk about the mayor economy, 市长, 市长经济, right? So local economy are really playing a very critical role in supporting their local economy. And so I think that is really, you know, the government is utilizing their fiscal tool uh, to help the economy, even though they don't publicize it. So I think that is, this is the interesting um, aspect of the Chinese economy. Yeah, that's let's let's talk about this a bit more. Um, and you know, I I know very very little <clears throat> about the Chinese economy. Um, the especially the way such a large social um, um entity works. I mean, it's one point three billion. One point four. One point four billion people, which is humongous. And I mean, one thing about China is that okay, it is. It is one country. It is it is one one large macroeconomy, but it is so large that this that this entity must have very sophisticated ways of 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 guiding its internal mechanisms. Right? I mean, just the fact that China also doesn't have a complete freedom of movement, um, the way that you have it in 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 let's say let's say the U.S. I mean, the there's certain 
if you are born in a certain region and then you can move to a city, but you cannot necessarily access its social infrastructure the same way that locals can, right? There is not complete um, unity about everything, which is important. I mean, you need to manage somehow the flow of people, right? Um, does right. that also extend to the monetary realm? Um, is the, or in what in what way does the, the yuan work um, is it one single system or are there several kind of steps also with like the China's experiments with um, with digital currencies? Mm -hmm. um, is it one system or is it actually, you know, like many, many different ones on the one umbrella? Yeah, so um, it is in a way unified system, right? So China is a, uh, you know, um, with one central bank, which is the People's Bank of China, right? That is... Uh, the agent, right, that implements monetary policy that has the full control of the currency. And of course, you know, the Ministry of Finance is also um, the fiscal mm -hmm. branch of, of China. Um, so China is actually a unitary state, right? So the central government has all the, you know, decision making power. And but a lot of the implementations on the ground operations are deferred and relate to local governments. Um, so in this case, um, I think you know, when it comes to monitor policy, yes, the PBOC is still the one that makes the decisions, even though it does have different tools that it relies on compared to, for example, the Western. The Western usually has open market operations and there's a Fed funds rate that is a fundamental interest rate target. In China, it's a lot more complicated. It used to also, uh, there are different, you know, lending facilities. Um, there's different interest rates that they control. You know, there is a, deposit rates that they have the guidance, they have the prime, loan prime rates, they have the, you know, uh, seven day repo, uh, reverse repo rates. So there are many different instruments that the Chinese central bank has. But nonetheless, it is still a centralized monetary system where the central bank is in charge of this monetary policy, right? And they can through, again, different policy instruments. Um, the re reserve requirement ratio is one of the ones that the central bank often used in China, but not very much by the Fed, for example. Um, and this is a way to kind of regulate how much liquidity um, and also how much is the cost of the bank lending in the economy. So they do similar things as the Western you know, central banks, um, and they also have the complete control of the monetary system. Now, in terms of fiscal system, it's also very interesting. Um, China had a one really big fiscal reform in 1996, and that's where it sets the central local relationship, right? That a lot of tax over half, a little bit over half of the taxes would go to the central government and mostly is the um, value added tax, um, not as much income tax, personal income tax. Um, so a lot of the half of, at least half, more than half of the tax goes to the central government. And yet the local governments are asked to be responsible for a lot of the spending, right? They spend for the local economies, they spend to deliver some essential public services and public programs at their localities. And so that creates really much this imbalance um, that you know sometimes the central government orders the local government to put on certain projects, but then the financing uh, needs, right, is not being supported by the central government. So the local yeah. government will have to pay the bill, so to speak. Yeah. And right? the, the, important, yeah. the important thing, of course, is that under MMT, national government can can appropriate precisely and can limitlessly, but local governments can't. They they are very much precisely. they need they need these little taxes that MMT says on on the big one you don't need. So how does China solve that problem? Yeah, that's great. I think you you really hit the nail on the head, and that is precisely the problem, right? So when you have the central government that is only taking on about twenty one percent of the GDP worth of debt, mm. and the local government is taking you know over fifty percent, and then plus the hidden debt, then that is anywhere you know. Everybody's a guess, right? But at least, you know, 90% of GDP is debt at the local government level. And so that is really problematic because the central government has, like you just said, right, the monetary sovereignty. They are able to issue the currency. They are able to, you know, uh, fiscally spend. The local governments can't, right? And it's not until 2014 that they're allowed to issue bonds, actually. Previously, they, they are not even allowed to issue bonds, right? So that really leaves them in the limbo. So if you ask me what to do, I think, you know, the solution is very simple. You have to realign, right, your fiscal revenues and your spending responsibilities. That's as simple as it gets. If you want the local, local government to continue to spend, if you believe the spending should take place in the local level, then you need to give them more taxing power. You need to give them more tax revenues. 
But does yeah. that mean that does that mean that under your analysis at the current time, um, China is running this huge problem that its lo local uh, municipalities are actually getting into debt that without national reform, they will not be able to get out of, which is like funny because that's usually not what MMT argues, but on the local level, it is like that. Yeah, yes, it's precisely that. It's precisely that. So it's, it's, a, it's a very um, misconstrued, I think, the system, right? That the central government has all the power to spend and yet the local government is asked to take on all the debt and to spend. And so, you know, if we're talking about this in a political vacuum, right? I would say the solution is very simple. We can solve it tomorrow, right? Just make sure either you increase the fiscal transfer from the central government to the local government, which is what China has been doing. Right now, the, the central government's fiscal transfer accounts for about half of the revenues of the local governments. Um, that helps, right? But at the same time, the fiscal transfer has many, many difficulties, right? One of the things is that when it transfers, it goes through different levels, right? From the provincials, then to the city, to the county, and then to the village. So through this whole process, a lot of times the money just disappear, right? In, in the middle, in, in, the, in the black hole. And so that is not very efficient. Um, so, but there's other ways they can do it, right? So like I said, you could have a fiscal reform to allow the central government uh, to, you know, to, to, to give more taxing powers and revenue uh, to the local government, revenue shares to the local government, right? So all these can be done. There's no technical barriers for any of these to be accomplished, right? It just stroke a pen, you can make it happen tomorrow. So why is it not happening, right? That definitely has to do with the political uh, considerations, right? Because again, China, you know, the, 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 the top leaders want to centralize the power. They do not want to distribute the power so much to these different localities, which, you know, you, you would understand with a big country with 1.4 billion people with so many different provinces, right? You worried about that kinds of, you know, power diffusion. And I think that political, it's it, the political barrier, right? It's what prevent the kinds of systematic reform. Um, China has been talking about fiscal reform for decades, right? It's not just years. Every time they talk about we need to have a fiscal reform and nothing really happened. And even today, as you just talked about, right? China's economy has some headwinds. The local government debt is a problem, but the central government is still very hesitant to anything dramatic, right? Anything that is sort of a, 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 a fix, a real fix, right? They simply dodge the problems. Um, they allow the local governments to equal, issue more debt, they themselves issue more central government debt and then funnel the money to the local governments. Um, there's still a very, you know, I would say insurmountable hesitancy, right, to relinquish the kinds of power to the different local governments. And they also worry if you help these local governments, this is gonna create more moral hazards, right? The local governments say, oh, I don't need to pay for this. I'll just spend like no tomorrow. And so that is really what I think underlying uh, the problem and the concerns. Yeah. Is there at least a um a, <clears throat> fis a fiscal transfer mechanism in place in China? Uh, because you know the EU doesn't have that. The EU has a mo uh, not the EU. Sorry, the 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 euro the euro the Euro eurozone uh, area yeah. the eurozone has mm -hmm. a single currency, but no way of transferring uh money from from the the better performing economies, better performing, it's the wrong, it's the wrong expression from net exporters to net importers, yes. right? Um, yes. And there's no way to transfer the money back. And then what, what happens is that naturally one accumulates all of those monies and the other one, the other one just, just loses out and has to go into further debt. And, you know, when things go really bad, they go Greek bad. And it's not necessarily the fault of the Greeks. It's the fault of the way the system works. Um, and it's because there's no fiscal transfer mechanism. Swiss, Switzerland, the 26 cantons, it has a fiscal transfer mechanism. Does China have that um, so that at least some imbalances inside the, the economy are smoothened out? Precisely. China does, right? So China is not a Eurozone. Um, the Eurozone countries, like you said, exactly, there's no fiscal integration. And, and MMT, starting from the day one, has questioned this design flaw of the Eurozone, that you have monetary integration, but you don't have fiscal integration. Um, but at the same time, you know, institutions are then made. So if the ECBs could purchase, you know, government securities in an unlimited way during COVID, it could do it anytime. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, again, the political barriers, the ideologies, right? And, and also, I would say maybe also, you know, some of these uh, um, um, geopolitical, you know, sort of factors 
all of this could prevent, you know, this kind of fiscal transfer from happening uh, within the Eurozone. Now in China, um, there is fiscal integration. Um, and when it comes down to it, I think the central government will help the local governments. Um, but again, like I mentioned earlier, there's all these political factors that prevent the system from being revamped, right, in, in a very fundamental way. But they will fix the problems in a patchwork mm. kind of manner, right? Like which government is, is it's not working now. It, it's, you know, it needs a bailout. The central government will do that. Right. And they do have the fiscal transfer, as I just mentioned, they have two different types of transfer. They have a transfer that is for specific purposes. Like if the if this province is building a dam, right, then the central government say, oh, I will transfer some money specifically designated earmarked for that project. But otherwise, there's also the general purpose transfer, which is basically, OK, this locality has deficit, deficit and debt problem. We will help a little bit. But again, as you see, this is a very um, uh, sort of the after the fact, right? It's not the proactive, it's not the preemptive kind of uh, uh, um, uh, system. Um, but if things really go wrong, central bank, central government will uh, will have to intervene, right? Yeah. So I think that that's the that's the difference, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. They do they do little evolutions of the system in place instead of a, of a of a general overhaul, which is also a prudent exactly. approach, by the way. It's like, because whenever yes. you do big overhauls, you the wrecking hammer could really destroy stuff. Last question on China: um, In Western media, when we talk, when we hear about the 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 problems of the Chinese economy, it's usually somehow connected to uh, the real estate crisis and. And mm -hmm. real estate is in is in is in is in huge problems, and China will collapse, and blah 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 blah. And that's something that's very easy to understand for the West because the real estate is usually what blows up the Western economies. That's what blew up in two thousand and eight. Like that was the root yes. cause. So it's really easy to map that. But are you more worried about real estate problems or banking problems, or are you more worried about the local? Uh, um, uh, local government's inability to manage their funds? Which one of the two do you think is actually the bigger problem? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I do think the local government debt is a bigger problem, even though I think those two are completely connected, right? Mm -hmm. Because the local government used to really rely a lot on land sales um, and also these real estate de uh, development to revive and to you know boost their local economies. So when the real estate sector uh, is in a slump that affects the uh, local government's revenues mm. and therefore that exacerbates the debt problem. Mm. Um, I would say, you know, the real estate challenge is real. Um, it's real in the sense that there is the supply side factors, right? I'm sorry, but economists are funny. They like to compartmentalize the problem, right? So there's the supply side problem, which is that, you know, real estate used to account for 20% of GDP. And if you include all these other related sectors, that's like 30% of the GDP. And so without that real estate construction, you inevitably see that investment goes down and the economy slows down. But I think China is managing now very well. Uh, I would say in this very sort of controlled demolition of the housing bubble, nothing like what the United States has, you know, did, has done, right? Let the market explode and it take down the entire economy, took more than 10 years to recover. And Japan, right, that's even worse. Um, I think China is doing it in actually a really measured way. And so far, I think the uh, collateral damages have been well under control. Um, the reason I say that is because we see a large economic activity shift from the real estate sector to uh, manufacturing sector, right? Especially those tech and investments and high tech investment has been going up by 10% in the last few years. So a lot of bank loans used to go to the real estate sector. Now they're diverted to the industrial sector. So now if you look at the changes, the real estate sector has gone down in the GDP to about 18%. And then you see the industrial and, and especially manufacturing sector has rise up to fill that void. So I think from the supply side, I think China is making that transition rather successfully. Mm. The difficulty, of course, is on the demand side. What it means is that you know real estate is 70% of the household's wealth. Um, you know, 93% of the Chinese families own a house, right? And a great proportion of people hold more than one house. They use the housing as investment assets. So when the housing value is going down, right, in some places, 20%, even 30%, or whatever the number might be, um, because the government number for that is definitely tricky, right? That creates a problem because the households feel less wealthy, they spend less, 
and they're not buying houses, so they're not buying household appliances, and so on and so forth. And so that created a lot of demand side problems. That's why you hear all these sort of uh, um, demand deficiency problems in China, which I think is a is a is a problem. Um, so, but at the same time, I think you know if we gradually stabilize the housing market, which is exactly what the Chinese government now is doing, right? They're trying to tackle the two biggest problem in the housing market. One is the unfinished uh, housing projects. Um, they allow the banks to put these uh, housing projects in their on the so-called white list. So allow them to take bank loans and finish the projects because people already pay for them, right? You need to deliver mm -hmm. them. Um, second is the housing inventory, right? So Goldman Sachs said that China has about 7 trillion yuan worth of inventory that needs to be get rid of. Um, and so again, in the recent weeks and months, you see the slew of policies where Local governments purchase these housing for social housing purposes, right? And also, you know, uh, uh, um, remove the a lot of housing restriction, uh, housing purchase restrictions, right? Like um, I'm from originally from Guangzhou City, right, the third largest city in China. Um, they basically scrapped all the housing purchase restrictions, right? And so that really helped to, in a way, you know, increase the demand a little bit and help to stabilize the prices in the housing market. Um, so at least right now, some of the um, uh, you know, the, the more micro level data has suggested that the transaction has gone up by a lot, right? In places like Shanghai or Beijing, you see anywhere between 30% to 50% increase in the housing deals just in the month of October. So the market is reacting. So hopefully that would help to stabilize the price. And as a result, this is going to make people feel better in terms of the housing values and boost their confidence and go out and spend more. I think that would be really helpful um, to the economy.